right. Well, welcome to Creator Conference 2018, formerly known as Geek Conference. And um, we had some, some input that um, people didn't want to be geeks. I'm not sure why. So uh, the name was changed to Creator Conference. But I'm just here to tell you that you are all certified geeks just because you're here tonight. <clears throat> so don't worry about don't worry about that. And uh, especially it's like 75 and sunny outside. So yeah. I, I mean, you're here to learn about science when it's 75 and sunny outside. So you uh, that's an extra merit badge for you. So, but uh, excited to have Pastor Jack in town uh, this weekend. So excited to hear him tomorrow morning, um, and then tomorrow night at, at Pekin. So it'll be a good time. Um, Pastor Rob's going to be following up uh, me and trying to do as good as I do, so um, looking forward to uh, seeing him struggle through that. But uh, <clears throat> No, seriously, though, Rob, Rob, I love Pastor Rob. He's, a, he's an awesome guy, and uh, he's a very uh, smart individual, so excited to hear what he's got for us tonight. All right, well, I want you all to imagine getting a phone call, and that phone call is... It's from, um, just pick your favorite media outlet. We'll just say, just always stay bipartisan here. Um, and the media outlet calls you and says, hey, I, I've, been hearing about, I've been hearing about you. We want to do an interview. You're a very interesting person. Um, and so what we want to interview about is God, the Bible, and science. And so being the good and equipped uh, individual Christian that you are, you say, well, absolutely, um, let, let's do this. And so you agree to it, you get there, and then the first question uh, out of the gate is, well, you know, why don't, you're Christian, so you believe in creationism, well, yeah. So, so why, why don't you believe in evolution? I mean, really, why not? I mean, science points towards it, to it, so why, why don't you believe in evolution? Um, and then, you know, why would you believe the Bible over science? I mean, you want truth, right? I mean, so why, you know, we've got these things that we see, so why would you believe, why would you believe the Bible over science? So um, just kind of keep that in your, in your thoughts. <laughs> and uh, Bree, I want you to, uh, I want you to answer those questions for me. <laughs> 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 Not right now. Don't put me on. Okay, <laughs> that's right. I picked I picked her because I knew I knew I'd make her squirm. So, but um, in all seriousness, no. Most the vast majority of people don't get called by CNN, don't get called by Fox News, aren't on the air, don't you know, aren't in the limelight. But every single one of us have conversations, and you can have uh, more conversations than, than you do right now. I can have more conversations than I do right now, but. You know, whenever you're um, having conversations, sometimes those conversations will um, just kind of naturally move in the direction to talk about science and or maybe talk about the Bible. Sometimes it's a brute force thing, uh, but most <laughs> the best conversations are um, basically when you you're talking about it and then you kind of the Holy Spirit nudges you, hey, that's that's let's take this go from here and here and here and here. So, um, but so as believers, we have to be equipped to be able to have those conversations, to talk to people. Because the reality is that, and I think the church as a whole uh, doesn't focus on science enough. And I know Pastor Jack would say, amen, right? Yeah. So Pastor Jack would say amen. And, but in all seriousness though, I think a lot of the reason that youth um, and even adults, the reason that they kind of stray away from the faith is because of a misunderstanding of science and what they keep hearing over and over and over again, whether it be media or school or um, whatever. So, do a little transition here. Thank you, sir. All right. Yes. Technology is alive and well. And get a mouse so I can click myself. So I wouldn't have to say click like 50 times during the entire <coughs> sermon. So, all right, so where was I? So um, science is a major reason why um, people leave the church, youth, when they go off to college, they don't, they kind of leave the church and then they don't come back because they, they've heard it in high school and they hear it 
more in college, this gets more reinforced. And unfortunately, what gets reinforced is not necessarily um, all of the, what I would, what you call observational science. So observational science is where you actually can do experiments, you see what, see what you get, and you actually observe it. You can see it in real time. Um, the other aspect of that is historical science, which is basically projecting, extrapolating back into the past um, based on what you know now. Now, obviously, when you extrapolate, when you go beyond what you can see, there's prone to be error. And so, um, but a lot of people get tripped up on that historical science, and they think that that's actually, because it's taught this way, it's actually firm, and it's, it's verifiable science, when in reality, it's not. Um, so speaking of going way, way back tonight, we're going to talk about the origin of life. And this is one of the uh, biggest hurdles that I would say that um, has not been solved, and I don't think it honestly will ever be solved um, in, in the natural. And, and, even, and even if they do, it's still, even if scientists do somehow come up with all the, the molecules and everything, and combine them into the right uh, cellular components and everything, and create a, a, a microbe or a single cell organism, um, that still demonstrates that there's intelligent design behind the creation of life. So until that actually happens on its own, without scientists, then there's, there's no leg to stand on there. So um, let's go on to the current evolution, evolutionary timeline. OK, so one of the things, thank you very much. That was, that's very helpful. Um, one of the things that when you're talking with people, and to have credibility with people, and to understand, and sometimes you can actually change your opinion on some things, is to understand what the um, typical, what the quote other side has to say about certain things. And so we're going to be looking at, at that a little bit tonight. Um, we're also going to com contrast it with the creationism version of that. Um, and then we're going to get, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So. Let's look at the current evolutionary time school. So as, as typically is taught um, in school. Um, so Big Bang to Earth, um, t that is called what I'll call cosmic evolution. Now, um, what we're saying here is going from 13.8 billion years ago to 4.6 4 uh, billion years ago. BYA is billion years ago, just abbreviating. KYA is 1,000 years ago. So uh, the current belief in evolutionary circles is that uh, the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago, um, and then 4.6 billion years ago is kind of when the Earth formed in its first rough fashion. Um, and so what we're going to call that for tonight is cosmic evolution. Now, obviously, things in the cosmos changed after 4.6 billion years. We're just calling it, for the sake of tonight, this segment is cosmic evolution. Now, we're not, not going to talk about that at all, So, but I'm just setting up a, a context here. Now, the next phase here, 4.6 billion to 4 billion, is um, basically you have the Earth first formed, and then you get the first microbe. So roughly 600 million years is the theory where you get the first living thing. So a microbe is a single-celled organism. So for example, um, E. coli. Okay? E. coli bacterium is a single-celled organism. It's actually uh, about two micrometers in diameter. So uh, just for reference here, say this is a human hair. So this is 50 microns wide. So an E. coli, just everybody look, take a, pull a piece of your hair out and look at it. <laughs> so this is, we'll just, that's actually probably a little big, but we'll just call it, uh, this is the uh, E. coli bacteria. Okay, so that's a single cell organism. That's how s small it is, so it's incredibly small. It's kind of hard to fathom how small those things are. Um, on the contrary, how many cells do you think you guys have in your bodies? How many? Billions. Billions. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Closer. About 30 to 40 trillion cells. So when we're talking micro, we're talking just one of those. Okay? Now, obviously, if, you, if I lop off a piece of skin here, 
Um, it's not going to live on its own, but these guys live on their own. So, um, all right, so that, that's microbe. Now, in about four billion years, and you have rough, roughly about man, obviously there's some, some sway around that um, in evolutionary theory, but we'll just, for the sake of tonight, we'll say 200,000 years ago. I'm behind on my clicking. Rob, what'd you do? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, <laughs> got it. Am I on the screen? On, there it is, okay. So I got behind. So earth to, to microbe for terminology is chemical evolution. This is what we're gonna focus on tonight. And then the microbes to man evolution, uh, which is primarily what you learn about. Um, oops. Such. <laughs> no, it's just the first time I've used a mouse up here, so it's a novice thing. Um, microbes, man, that's typically what we, that's biological evolution, so that's typically what you learn about in school. Um, okay, everybody got the, got the context for that, where we are in the universe, timeline, and everything, words. So, the current evolutionary theory um, is that everything started with a microbe. So, okay, if everything started from a microbe, then uh, where on earth do you go from there? Pun intended. Um, that, was, that was a good joke. So, I'm just pulling out all the geek stuff tonight for everybody. Yes, thank you. So, this is the evolutionary tree. So, um, you've got bacteria, there's our, I don't know how to pronounce it, I think it's archaea on the other uh, branch here, and then all of, a lot of your multicelled organisms, so dinosaurs, plants, um, man, cats, dogs, horses, you know, everything, all the animals and seals and dolphins and everything that we like to play with, so. Um, so what happened is obviously you guys remember kingdom phylum class order family genus species you remember that from biology yeah so you know all that all that happened the animal kingdom all this branched off and this is what what you get what you see today so that's that's the current theory um, of evolution is that it all started off with a single celled organism a bunch of different kind or uh, phylum and families happen and then you have species so that is the evolutionary tree. Now, in contrast to that, you've got the uh, creationist, what I'll call orchard. Now, uh, we all know the creation account, right? So Genesis 1, um, let me get it up here. Genesis 1 and verse 11 says, then let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that the herb that yields uh, seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed in it is in itself on the earth and also, and, it, uh, and so on and so forth. It brings forth the grass. I talk about that so nonchalantly, but it was actually a pretty awesome thing. All right, and then the great sea creatures, the, every living thing that moves in verse 21 according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. So notice the word kind um, that, that happens throughout this. Uh, living creature, uh, cattle, and creeping thing, and beast of the earth. Um, sometimes a lot of guys think they're the beast of the earth, but um, each according to its kind. So, and then finally you have mankind. Okay, so there's all these different kinds being created. Now, the subject of debate is, okay, well what exactly was, a, what's a, define a kind? Um, and so what we have here, I think is probably the best, is so you've got all of these different trees in the orchard, right? So for evolutionary theory, you've got one tree and um, you start off with a microbe, a single thing, and it ends up being all this stuff. So you've got all this complexity going through this and you know, extinction of the dinosaurs and blah, blah, blah. <coughs> On contrary, creationist account is more of an orchard. So there's lots of different trees in the orchard and there's not as much um, a, a, a microbe does not become a man in, the, in this orchard. So let's say, for example, we talk about the cat kind, okay? Rob's favorite kind <laughs> is the cat kind. <clears throat> and so um, they were obviously earlier in the um, 
evolutionary timeline for you, right? <laughs> anyway, um, then plant kind and bacteria, and obviously this is a very simplified, but you have horses, so in that kind would be donkeys, horses, zebras, you know, all, all those kinds, um, or all those uh, animals in those kinds. You have dogs, so canines, dinosaur, man, um, and so on and so forth. But So all of those are kinds. So I think the best definition that I've heard as far as how to define a kind is basically can you mate and produce offspring? So what are things can, that can mate? You have a donkey and a horse, right? Produces a meal. You've got dogs that can mate and produce other kinds of dogs. And so you've got dogs and wolves and coyotes and, and all these different things and that kind. Now, how far back do you go in that to define the kind? I don't know if any of us know that answer, but I think um, the answer would be, well, whatever, uh, whatever can reproduce with each other, that's the kind. And so what you have um, on the timeline here is, so you've got the beginning. So evolutionary, when was the beginning? Evolutionary theory? 13.8, yep. So right now, and you can see here, and I know this would bother some people, but I put it there anyway. So we've got X thousand years ago. So I know there's, there's debate on, okay, is a day, are these days really a thousand years? Are they actual 24 hour days? I have my opinion, but just to not turn people off in this presentation to get to the main point, I left it as X, X thousand years ago. So, but the key is man created on the last day. So obviously if you go back through the genealogies and calculate ages and everything, it was roughly 6,000 years ago. So, um, so you've got man and animals and, and everything that God created, all the kinds God created. Then you've got a little bit, maybe a little bit of speciation there. And then you've got the next big event is the flood, right? So all these animals come on the ark. Did all of them get on there? Well, obviously, no, not every animal got on the ark. That wouldn't have been possible, but male and female of different kinds and stuff like that. Um, you could argue that dinosaurs got on the ark as well. Now, what does it make sense that a T-Rex about 15 feet tall got on the, got on the ark? No. <coughs> a unicorn? Yeah, there was a song about that. So uh, did nobody tell you they're extinct? <laughs> 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 but, so you could have had dinosaur eggs and so, um, and little bitty guys too. So they didn't have to take up this huge amount of space. Same thing with elephants. You didn't have to have adult sized elephants on the ark. You could have had little baby guys. So that's a, a, a way that you could have had a lot of animals on an insanely huge arc, by the way, especially for that time. It's big for today, but then back then, so it's pretty pretty big. If you got a chance to go down and see it in Kentucky, it's highly recommended. So I've never been in it, but we just pulled up in the parking lot and We've been in said hi. Yeah? <laughs> impressive. It's impressive. I, yeah. So anyway, a little plug there. We're going out of Kentucky soon, so. All right, so then you have the flood, and then um, there's speciation that, that would happen after that, and then you have the present. So this is more along the lines of the creationist orchard. So um, let's look at, uh, compare the two. So both, both models expect variation to arise, okay? You breed dogs, there's variation that happens, right? Um, both need at least three mechanisms, three mechanisms <laughs> to drive processes. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the science expert in the room. <clears throat> uh, three, yes, we'll get into numbers later, don't worry, they're all correct. <clears throat> all right, so you need at least three mechanisms to drive um, the processes for either microbes of man or creationism. The sun's energy, uh, random mutation, and natural selection. So from a scientific point of view, and we should not shy away from random mutation and natural selection. It happens, okay? Now, are those sufficient mechanisms to drive microbes into man? I would argue no. Um, so 
that's for another sermon, and I've only got 50 minutes because my time was cut down by 10 minutes by Pastor Bob, so I better get, <laughs> I better get going. So, the cr- oh, did you hear that? <laughs> so, are these sufficient? And actually, I, I preached on this at uh, Pastor Jack's a couple years ago. Um, are these sufficient to drive um, what we see today? So, this is uh, so biological. And then one big difference, obviously there's lots of differences, but one big... On here. There we go. Uh, one big difference is the starting point, right? So... For creationism, the starting point is kinds. For evolutionary life, the starting point is that little bitty microbe that we've got on the, on the, uh, on the human hair there. So we're going we're gonna to focus a little bit on this guy right uh, for tonight. So again, we're talking about chemical, uh, chemical evolution. All right. And there it is, in case you didn't know how to spell it. <coughs> All right, so I think I can work a mouse. Why this thing is going backwards? There we go. All right, so I think most people in, in here, I think it's safe to say the majority of people in here have had kids, right? <coughs> say most people have had kids. I would say everybody in here knows a kid, right? So, <laughs> yeah, just we would like to introduce you to some back there. And if you'd like to babysit, we will pay you a dollar an hour, and so we can go out on the date. That's expensive. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. So, has anybody ever been asked the awkward question, "Where do babies come from?" Okay. So I'm seeing a lot, a lot of head nodding in here, and it's a very awkward question, right? I mean, in that situation, you're like, okay, well, you have to consider their age, how much. Do you censor? Do you lie to them? Um, that's <clears throat> that's uh, that was for Pastor Rob and his Santa Claus stuff. So, um, but it's an awkward it's an awkward question, right? Because you just you just I mean, you know what the truth is, but it just makes you uncomfortable at times, and you have to stay calm and not say anything stupid. <clears throat> Yeah, go ask your, yeah, exactly. Is that what he did? Yeah. So, but even more awkward than where do babies come from is the question that you could ask scientists, where do microbes come from? How do we, how do we get the microbe? Now, in the par- case of the parents, you obviously know where babies come from. You were very actively involved um, <laughs> on where they came from. But for the scientists, they weren't around, right? They weren't around when the first microbe happened. The only person who was around was God and angels and, and Lucifer and you know all that, all that, uh, all the, the spiritual realm there. So it's an even more awkward question for evolutionists than the baby question for parents, is because they just don't know. I mean, there's there's theories, obviously. I mean, anybody <laughs> smart enough can come up with a theory. I mean, it's if, if you're smart enough, you can logic yourself into anything, right? Um, and so the, the most prominent theory of where do microbes come from is um, you have a uh, stork <coughs> that flies in and delivers the microbe uh, onto the earth. So, but no, you've got a very happy microbe up, up there um, and it's be- being delivered by a stork called soup. And soup, has anybody ever heard of the primordial soup? Okay, so this primordial soup, and soup is a very good word to me right now because we've been watching a lot of Swedish Chef from the Muppets. Does anybody remember watching that? So I was actually gonna put a picture of Swedish Chef up there, but I I decided not against that. Um, But, um, so he makes soup, he he tries, no, I'm not gonna do the impression. (laughs) Just wait till afterwards. I only got uh, a few more minutes, so. But anyway, so where do microbes come from? So the, the claim is the soup, okay? And the reality is, well, we're gonna go over what had to happen, but it's really the primordial soup is, you know, have you ever heard of the term God of the gaps? 
God of the gaps. So God of the gaps is basically, if we can't explain something, then we just say it was God. So it's a gap in knowledge, a gap in understanding. Well, it's God. Okay? So God of the gaps, on, on the, the evolutionary side and the science side of things, primordial soup is science of the gaps. So in other words, you don't understand it. They're probably not in the near term going to ever prove anything about it. So it's a science of the gaps. It's just, it's just a theory at this point. So the question is, is soup, pork, 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 sufficient, if you know a Swedish chef, you'll know what that <laughs> to produce uh, everything, uh, here, let me read this again, I can read. Is soup sufficient to produce everything required for life? So that's the question. If the, the pro most prominent claim is that a primordial soup produced life, okay, well, let's look at that. Let's examine that. Let's know what your theory is, and let's examine it. So, what had to happen? So, first thing that had to happen is obviously you have atoms and small molecules, okay? So, those were around, obviously, when the Earth was formed. Okay, now, all of these specific molecules that gave life, uh, gave rise to life, had to be at the same location at the same time. Now, remember, there's a scale there in billions of years, so it had to be, it had to be at the same time. And then what arose from that? Well, it had to be, obviously, all the components of a cell. Now, I'm not going to get into theories on which one came first before the other one. I think a, lot of, a prominent one is RNA right now. Um, but you've got all these different things that are in cells that had to arise uh, to form a cell, obviously. You have to have the components of the system to have the system, the microbe. Um, and then all of these things, regardless of how uh, little chance there is for these to actually come into being, which we're going to go into DNA um, a little bit later. So all of these components had to arise at the same time, at the same location. Okay, we're not, they didn't have any beam me up Scotty stuff back then. You know, so they had to be at the same location, and then they had to know what to do to organize into a cell membrane. So anybody from a manufacturing background understands, and I think, I think you've actually got some manufacturing background, don't you? That there has to be intelligence behind organizing things and putting things together. You know, I work on engines, and there's lots of, there's hundreds of components of engines, and somebody has to be behind it designing it to put it together. But this all happened um, by chance. And then, at that point, you have a microbe. Now, just because you have a microbe doesn't mean, and all those elements present, doesn't mean they know what to do with each other. They might. So there's another thing where you have to have intelligence um, designed into that uh, to make it happen. Now, um, there's basically two things that would have to lead to this rise in life. Um, raw energy, which, um, where did that come from? Where would that have come from? Energy. What's the big ball of energy that we have that supplies, supports life? It's the sun, yes. Yes, exactly. Very correct. What were you going to say? AT well, I know. We're talking more macro okay. than that. Okay. She said ATP. It's the it's the energy currency of the cell, right? Basically. So all right. So this basic formula explains uh, so you got raw energy and then you've got chance equals uh, information over time. Now, what does information mean? Okay, on a basic level. Somebody shout it out. What's information? Data. Data? knowledge okay so to help illustrate information let's look at a series of uh, things that I typed on here so this this one right here is anybody getting much out of what I wrote here okay and this is analogous to a kids playroom so after you let you can have it completely orderly and send three kids down to the basement into your playroom and in a half hour it will be not orderly it will be very complex and there's very little information that you can gain from it 
<laughs> except, except for uh, a dose of stress. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, so there's very little information there. Okay, now let's go a step further. And let's, I typed creator, 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 okay? So that is orderly, right? It's repetitive pattern. It's not very complex. And uh, so there is a little bit of information, but there's not a lot, right? There's just creator a bunch of times. And Crystal, I am not, um, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that there's little information in you. I'm just saying that there's crystals and that, um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sans crystal in the back. So, all right, so there's little information. All right, now, we're getting complex here. So, CreatorCon, that's short for conference, by the way. CreatorCon, it's right here, too. So, CreatorCon, is at Grace. So, I would have made it more complex, but I ran out of room on the slide, so that's all you get. So, CreatorCon 2018, is that great? So it tells you the year, right? It tells you what it is, the name, um, and tells you where it's at. Now in Morton, there's like 10 graces, so I might need to narrow that down a little bit. But <laughs> um, that's analogous physically to a microbe, okay? Yeah, not really, just for the sake of relative information here. So it's orderly, right? I put some intelligence into it. The first one I put no intelligence into, other than moving my fingers. It's complex, right? There's, there's words that make sense right ac after each other. So there's a lot of information there compared to the sentence above it and the sentence above that, right? Now, you'll notice here that as you go down, there's intelligence, more intelligence required than that. There's more information, okay? Now, think back to what I said. It was raw energy and chance, right? So what do you think raw energy, where do you think it tends to drive things? Do you think it t tends to drive it up or back? So raw energy, unharnessed, let's say you just got a bonfire. Do you think that causes more or less order? Less order, yep. So you're burning things up. You did have nice tree logs, and you were the anti-green person that you were, and you chopped them down, and you burnt them just to make all of the lefties upset, okay? <laughs> and so the... Sorry about that, we can edit that out. <laughs> but <laughs> so what happens with raw energy? Raw, raw energy from the sun um, or anything else, just, just you can observe, if you don't harness that energy, it's going to destroy, not create. Right? So raw energy in itself doesn't produce anything orderly. You have to take that fire and stick it in the cylinder and have a piston down here that can, and you can perform work on that piston and produce something uh, makes or produce energy or move water or move your car or something like that okay so raw energy unless you have machinery to that knows how to harness it and create something it destroys it doesn't and, and you didn't have that back then you didn't have that machinery available in the evolutionary model you didn't have any of God's intelligence available to make those things work right okay so that's uh, information and raw energy. Now let's look at chance. And I want to leave plenty of time for this. This is fun. All right. Has anybody heard of the infinite monkey theorem? Have it, has anybody wished they would have heard it, of it before tonight? <laughs> so basically it states that uh, a monkey with a typewriter would eventually type Shakespeare. Or there was a debate back in the 1800s where somebody said, um, you know, he'd eventually type the 23rd Psalm. Okay? Well, let, let's look at that. Let's look at the probability um, of this. So, let's not talk about Shakespeare. Um, the complete volumes of Shakespeare, because I don't know how, I've never read it, and I have no idea how long it is, but I assume it's ex extremely long. Extremely long. Extremely long. Have you read it? Oh, well, there you go. So, and so, 
I'm sure you're per uh, correcting my grammar throughout this whole thing, so I appreciate that. <laughs> so, thanks. <laughs> it's good. I should have talked to you before I talked tonight. So, um, so the first, the first sentence says, monkey with a typewriter uh, would eventually type Shakespeare. Okay, it's 58 characters long, including the spaces, right? So what's the chance of a monkey or Rob typing <laughs> the first sentence, 58 uh, characters long, uh, and, and we'll, give, we'll shrink the keyboard a little bit just to give him a better chance. Okay, it, it's only, it's only 20, uh, 26 letters plus the space bar. Okay, and you have to, um, well, we'll just go back to the monkey because it's not fair with you. The, the monkey will just, <laughs> will type. <laughs> The, the monk, the monkey will just keep typing, and they actually did this. And they, some of the they obviously it was random, and it, sometimes they just kept on pressing the same one. Sometimes they beat on it, and you know. So, what are the chances of him typing the first sentence, not Shakespeare, not the twenty third Psalm, just the sentence that is probably grammatically incorrect? Um, yes, we have the master geek in the corner. <laughs> And so, let's just say he typed one, uh, one letter a second, okay? So the chances of that happening are 1 in 3.3 .3 times 10 to the 76 years. Okay, so this is where we start, when you talk about chance and like, uh, we start getting into numbers that you just can't comprehend uh, with your head. So, just for a reference and people who aren't math majors, so... So just a reference, so 10, let me make this bigger, uh, 10 to the third is, how many zeros should I add on there? Three. Three, okay. All right, let's, let's jump some, some uh, numbers here. All right, 10 to the nine is one with how many nines? This is really a problem. Nine. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. All right. This is one billion. So just think of, okay, when we're talking about 13.8 billion, it's 13.8, this is, this would be 13.8 uh, times 10 to the ninth years for the current evolutionary time, time period. I rounded to, to 1.4. So math lesson, if you move the decimal there, then it's 1.4 times 10 to the 10, okay? So, there may be some of you out there saying, okay, so. <laughs> so you're telling me there's a chance. Um, yeah, not really Lloyd. So, th this, when we're talking about one in 10 to the 76, so. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat here. I'm just gonna go ten to the twenty, and then we're just gonna say ditto, and then there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven more, eleven more zeros. So that's ten to the twentieth. Okay, and we're talking three point three times ten to the seventy sixth. So this is on the order of the, the supposed age of the universe. This is 10 to the 20th, so you've got all these extra zeros here. So just imagine there's uh, 56 more zeros that I don't have room to write. So the chance is one in that many, I don't even know if there's a bazillion number for 10 to the 76th, but it'd probably be out here in years. And the supposed age of, our, age of our universe is only that big, only that long, right? Yes, sir. It's estimated there's only 10 to the 78 atoms. Thank you, universe. thank you. I was, I thought about that before I came, but I did not look it up. So, did everybody hear what he just said? So atoms that make up the molecules that make up our cells, there's only in the universe, there's 10 to the 78 of those. Atoms. atoms. In the entire universe, okay? So obviously wow. you can't fathom the universe, but 
there's roughly that many atoms in the universe. Okay? So, um, th exactly. For, for a monkey to type just one line of grammatically incorrect uh, <laughs> Shakespearean <laughs> quality. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, infinite monkey theorem. How can I screw that one up? <laughs> that's, that's what it's called. I have met my match. <laughs> but, so, there's this guy named Sir Arthur Eddington. Uh, he was an astronomer, physicist, physicist mathematician. Um, highlights that this infinite monkey theorem, it, the point is not to say that there, there is a chance. Because you can say, okay, well, it's 1 in 3.3 times 10 to the 76 years. Um, but the, the, the point of it is that at certain levels of probability, the, the term improbable uh, is functionally equ equivalent to impossible. So at some point, you have to say it's impossible. And I would think with this, since you only have roughly 14 billion years to uh, work with here, that that is impossible. No, again, we're not telling you there's a chance. All right. Um, has anybody, this current evolutionary theory thinks there's a finite universe or an infinite universe? This isn't a trick question. It's a finite universe, right? 13.8. So it started 13.8 billion years ago, according to evolutionary theory. So it started. Okay? How it started, nobody knows. Um, Leave a single point and expanded. But <coughs> let's just say that you did have an internal, eternal universe. Well, you can't have an eternal universe. Because the second law of thermodynamics, which I'm sure everybody is just on their seats, and he's feeling it. You see on the spirit, <laughs> the spirit over there. Ba basically, applying it to the universe means that the available energy of the universe um, eventually is going to all be used up, and it's going to go to zero, right? To some to some steady state value, and so you have to have a starting point because the sun's using up energy, right? It's it's got some fusion going on. It's releasing energy. Eventually. If the universe went on for long enough, it would go to equilibrium, right? You wouldn't have any temperature differences. The sun would be the same temperature as the earth. And so that, that's what that is. So the second law of thermodynamics forbids uh, an eternal, eternal universe. There's also something called sometime, somewhere. Um, so basically, well, at some time, somewhere, you know, it, it had to have happened. But the reality is, once you go beyond uh, the falsifiable, what I mean by that is I could come up with, there's a spaghetti monster out in the sky. You know, there's, there's a chance. There's, is he out there? Did you find him? <clears throat> is it? It is. I know. I know. Yes, it is. It, I'm just going to sit down after that one. <laughs> it's an apostasy. I mean, it's just crazy. So we're in full, full geekdom mode right now. So, and I don't have much time left. All right. It's, it's outside the realm, no, realm of science, reality. You talk about a multiverse. You know, our universe spawned another universe, or we were spawned by another universe. You know, it, all that stuff is outside the realm of science. So you can debate all day, but nobody can prove, can prove it. And, well, maybe there's another universe with different rules. Okay, well, we're in this universe with our rules. So um, those rules had to produce us for your theory to be correct. All right, now, the biggest Achilles heel of chance um, is what's called reversibility. Does anybody remember back in chemistry where you'd have, like, you'd have molecules on one side, molecule, molecules on the other side, and then you'd have an arrow it's balancing equations. Sometimes you have an arrow that goes back. Remember? So reactions always, d just like the monkey, he's typing up. He's typing away. And eventually, in 10 to the 76th years, he, he types a grammatically incorrect sentence about Shakespeare. And so um, that's assuming that the monkey keeps on typing and the letters keep on staying. 
Now, reversibility basically means that, let's say that instead of typing, there's reactions going on. Well, the reactions don't always go in one way. Sometimes they go backwards. Sometimes they reverse. So that's equivalent to putting a backspace key on the monkey's keyboard, and he's typing away, and then occasionally he hits backspace. Right in the middle of typing that 58 character, he hits backspace, and he's got to start all over again. So reversibility basically is another, it's basically a nail in the coffin to chance. There's already been plenty of nails, but that's just another nail. All right. Do you feel something on this slide? <laughs> <coughs> All right, so we talked about atoms, right? So we've got, um, so we've got the hydrogen atom, carbon atom, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. So hydrocarbons has a C and an H in varying levels of each. What are hydro hydrocarbons? Why do you like hydrocarbons? Because you put them in your car and they make you go, okay? Or Elon Musk just screwed up that whole statement there, but um, most cars, electric car. Okay. He's got burn coal plate electric. What's that? He's got a burn coal plate electric. That's true, that's true. Um, carbohydrates and lipids, lipids. So I, don't know, I just thought of Miss Lippy for some reason. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Miss Lippy. All right, an H, C, and an O, carbohydrates and lipids. So that's the stuff that you try to keep off of your body, but it tends to hang on unless uh, you, there's a lot of hard work. All right, so amino, amino acids and proteins, you had an N and an S. And eventually you get down to uh, nucleic acids, RNA, uh, and DNA. Now, you feel anything else on this one? Do you feel anything else on this? It's good. Okay. <laughs> so. Oh, ribonucleic acid. Yep. Um, so you've all you've probably all seen the the double helix, right? Or the helix here. Okay. And you've got uh, these rungs in here called base pairs, and this is base pairs broken up into what the actual atoms they are. So I bring this up not to study it. Um, and to have you memorize it, but basically just to say, this is a base pair, every rung here, and this is what the atoms are for, for those base pairs, the different DNA um, or the different uh, nucleobases. All right, so I talked about E. coli earlier, right? So let's up the ante from 58, uh, 58 letters uh, in that sentence. Now we gotta make the sentence four million base pair is long. There would be a run-on sentence, or it'd be a, uh, uh, well, it'd be a, uh, it'd be, you can't use and more than once, right? Well, you can use. Okay. I'm not going, I'm not asking you a question anymore. You can start a sentence. I wasn't an English major, all right? So. Although I did write a 200 page book, so, you know. That's right, it was proofread by somebody else. Wait, yeah. so, <laughs> so, four million base pairs long. Okay. So, remember, base pairs are those molecules, those, those rungs in the ladder. Okay? That's all fit into this. Fifth, basically, a 25th of a hair, it's all fit into that four million base pairs. And to get all of those base pairs right, the, the chance of that is not, I think it, it was 10 to the 76, right? For the 58 letter. This is 10 to the 2 million. So incomprehensible, you can't comprehend it. You can't comprehend 10 to the 76, right? much less 10 to the 2 million. And everybody's wondering why there's a Rubik's cube up there. So. I got mine here. Um, all right, who's going to solve this? There you go. There's the YouTube video you can use. <laughs> hey. Oh. 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 That was rough. Man, no Christmas presents for you. Uh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> 
So hey, let's get back. Let's get back on back on on, on track here. So I'm losing control. Um, but four four million base, now just to like imagine this enough information in less than the size of a hair the cell that if you were to have every base pair in that DNA to be a word it would take five Bibles to hold all of that information so think of, so basically if you have every word so there's 780 88 thousand words in the Bible. So you divide um, um, having trouble with the calculations. I ran the calculations beforehand, so you'll have to trust me on it. So basically, if you make every word a base pair, then it's equivalent to five Bibles. So, um, obviously you can't comprehend 10 to the 2, two million so what this guy, Sir Fred Hoyle, professor of astron astronomy at Cambridge, he basically equated that to, let's, let's have 10 to the 50 people, okay? How many people are in the world? There's eight times 10 to the ninth, right? Roughly, okay, eight, eight billion. So if you had 10 to the 50 people, you blindfolded them, and they all had to solve this blindfolded. Now, I know there's kids that can do that, but they, you know, they look at it beforehand. So, but you have bl 10 to 50 blind people, which you are not going to have that many people, and then they all solve it at the same time. So they don't know what everybody else is doing. So that's the chances of just the simplest of uh, organisms, a single-celled organism, happening by chance. So the the, the argument of chance is absolutely absurd. At some point, it's so um, probability doesn't even exist. I mean, it doesn't even come to the picture. It's so improbable that it's impossible. Um, there's only a few slides left, I promise, Lob. Rob. Lob. Come on up, Lob. <laughs> so let's compare to the humans, right? So E. coli had 4 million. Well, humans have 3.2 billion base pairs. Um, those are on 30, 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell's nucleus. If you're wondering how many Bibles that is, the E. coli was five. Human, roughly 4,000 Bibles to contain it. And there's 30 to 40 trillion of them in, in your cell, or in your body. And all that had to come from a microbe. So, let, let's, let's wrap up. So, we talked about the evolutionary tree. We talked about the creationist orchard. Which story best explains the origin of life? Okay? To have a microbe, you have to deal with all that improbability, and which essentially is impossible, to come from one single-celled organism. So what makes sense? Non-living molecules becoming a microbe? or God actually creating kinds and having the information already built in and designed into the cells. Those are the, those are the two main competing arguments right now. Time and chance are not the allies of chemical evolution. A lot of times they're promoted as the allies, but they're not. Um, and science is actually an ally of creationists. Now remember when I um, started at the beginning talking about observational science, the stuff that we can actually see, that we can test, that I do at work, Every day, I, I put a certain amount of fuel in the engine. I see what emissions come out and um, don't get in trouble with the EPA and the EU and all that stuff. That's observational science, right? Historical science is stuff that, that goes way back, right, that we can't and attest to. And science is actually an ally of creationists. And so when we say science, we're talking observational science and what we can actually detect and what we know. So, all right, with that, I'm not going to open up for questions because we don't have time. Um, but Pastor Rob, I'm going to hand it over to you.